Thank you, Alyssa. And uh, it is good be, to be back at Central. You know, I've been here on more than one occasion in the past years, and uh, I'm a great admirer of David's work here with his choir and of the choir. And uh, so I'm honored to be asked to come back again and, and talk to you. And <clears throat> you also have the benefit tonight in your program of excellent uh, program notes uh, by John Bradley, uh, who discusses you know, the, the program, the music, uh, in depth and with great insight. And uh, I'm not going to compete with that. Uh, I, in fact, I'm going to do something which I think would be you know, kind of really different and not, not the sort of thing you would normally hear in a pre-concert lecture of Palestrina. Because uh, I'm going to talk about Palestrina after Palestrina. Uh -huh. And uh, because that's one of the things that makes Palestrina Palestrina <laughs> is what happened uh, to his legacy afterwards. And so hence the uh, title of uh, uh, Giovanni Luigi, Pierre Luigi da Palestrina, Legend and Legacy. Um, so first, just to set the context just a little bit. Um, as you undoubtedly know, in the first half of the 16th century, you had the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. And two landmarks of that, just to mention two, would be the uh, Luther's publishing the uh, his 95 Theses in uh, Wittenberg, and uh, in 1517, and then four years later, uh, he was actually excommunicated, and the, the battle was truly joined. Um, you also are aware, and so was the Catholic Church, that it was in deep trouble. That is to say, there were so many w ways in which it had uh, wandered from the true path that it should have been following. And um, as a result, uh, there was a strong sense that we must reform ourselves. And so we have the famous Council of Trent, which was called by the Pope um, in uh, 1545. It lasted until 1563, almost 20 years. Uh, there were 25 sessions of that council, uh, seven of them in the at the very end of that period. And in one of those uh, uh, sessions, uh, one of the foci was liturgical music. Now, there were a lot of complaints about music at that time. Um, and uh, many of them justified, some of them more kind of uh, matters of opinion, if you will, in taste and culture. But it, is, it was certainly true that um, the deportment of singers, for example, I mean, who didn't really take their job very seriously, even in the highest levels of Rome, the Sistine Chapel and so on, may surprise you. The Sistine Chapel choir never rehearsed, for example. <laughs> uh, and they had all kinds of silly rules uh, that were, had been there for ages. And, you know, but once you were there, you were there for life and nothing you could do about it and, and so on. Uh, that there were uh, things that had happened to the music. The chants had become corrupt. Uh, melodies had gotten changed. Uh, that's not so bad. And worse was the fact that um, various kinds of additions had been interpolated into these original chants uh, that uh, were centuries younger, um, often had nothing to do maybe with the uh, original liturgical meaning. Um, and in any event, it, it caused the services to go on too long and, uh, and so on. Uh, one category of uh, that we might think of as, uh, well, I think of two, uh, like the addition of tropes. This began very early in the Middle Ages, and these were additional melodies, or sometimes they would just simply text an existing melody, um, sometimes very artfully, but uh, it was not the original chant. And don't forget, back then, they thought that the chant had come directly from St. Gregory, who had a white dove whispering in his ear. So to mess with that was a serious business. And then you had additional things like uh, sequences. Um, and there were hundreds of them that had uh, uh, grown up over the centuries. And the, what the council did was to remove all of them except five, uh, such as the Dies Irae, a uh, famous chant, which I'm sure many of you know, uh, that was associated with, with the funeral mass, or Victime Pascale Laudes for Easter Sunday, and so on. 
Uh, but there were only five that were left at the end of the Council of Trent. Um, and uh, so there were, there, there were things like this that clearly needed to be cleaned up and improved. But the, the issue that concerns us tonight, most of all, was the complaint that in this polyphonic style that had developed over the centuries, people couldn't understand the texts because you had the polyphonic, polyphonic was a beautiful calculated art. I mean, really, truly, if you've heard so much of this kind of art here in this church uh, in, in past concerts. But the point was that um, if you have overlapping voices and they're singing the same words, but at different times, you are not going to be able to really get the text. And as a result, your heart will, and soul will be not lifted uh, to a state of piety as was felt appropriate and necessary. So this was the issue most of all that concerns us tonight of the intelligibility of text. And it is Palestrina, of course, who is the one who was understood to have saved the day. Um, I might add that uh, uh, there was argument over this. I mean, you have some, you have some cardinals in the, in the council who wanted to do away with polyphony entirely and replace it with chant, right? Um, you had some who recognized that there was a problem, but they didn't want to get rid of it entirely, and they wondered if there was some sort of a middle way. Uh, one of the famous cardinals who felt that way was uh, Carlo Borromeo, uh, who was a very interesting guy, and we can't talk about him a lot, but um, he played a, a central role in this. Um, and uh, in the end, oh, I should also point out that someone who really opposed the elimination of polyphony in the Catholic services was no less than the Holy Roman Emperor, Ferdinand I. Uh, he had his political reasons and cultural reasons for that. Um, and it's kind of hard to say no to the Holy Roman Emperor. You know? So in the end, what happened was that the council uh, decreed that the ecclesiastical uh, chiefs in, in the various provinces would determine what would happen in their own province. But they also uh, were uh, unanimous in saying, you have to clean up your act and get rid of all these extra things. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention was sometimes masses were based on secular tunes, uh, even vulgar or dirty tunes, and uh, including Palestrina, by the way. Uh, and uh, so they wanted to get rid of that, and they did. Now, what about Palestrina himself? I'm not gonna go into his whole life, but I'd like to point out that there were, uh, he was born near Rome and his whole life and career, um, or almost his whole life and career, uh, was uh, centered in Rome or very close to Rome. Um, Palestrina is the town nearby. We think that's where he was born, around 1525 or 1526. Um, and um, he was trained as a choir boy in Rome and then Got a, got a first job back in Palestrina. Well, it was very fortunate he did that. That may have been as kind of a backwater, but it happens that the Bishop of Palestrina was then elected Pope <laughs> Julius III. So uh, uh, in Palestrina had a very good connection and uh, the Pope then put him into the Sistine Chapel. Now you have to understand uh, that this ruffled some feathers because According to the rules of the Sistine Chapel, they elected their own members. And so this was on high. But of course, the Sistine Chapel, the Sistine Choir, was the Pope's personal choir. And so he was the boss. Uh, so he could do that. But uh, Palestrina, in fact, lasted only a year in the choir uh, in 1555 because there were three popes that year. His patron, Julius III, died. Then it was succeeded by Pope Marcellus II, Pope Marcellus Mass. Um, and uh, three weeks later, I think it was 22 days was his reign, he died. And then he was succeeded by a very stern, austere Pope, uh, Paul IV, who was determined to clean up the place. And among the things he did was to throw out from the Sistine Choir those members who were married. They weren't supposed to be married. And most members of the choir, in fact, were had taken or holy orders of some level. Uh, 
that was treated was a married man. And so he was forced out by the Pope uh, after less than a year in the choir. However, it wasn't all that bad because he then later got uh, commissions to write music for the choir, but he never rejoined it. So sometimes we, t we tend to think of Palestrina being associated with the Sistine Choir. He really wasn't. What the, the choir he was most associated with was that of the Capella Giulia, which is not so bad either. That is the choir of St. Peter's in Rome. Uh, so that would be like the number two choir in Rome, if you will. Um, and it was a kind of training ground for singers to, that would eventually go into the Sistine Chapel to some extent. But uh, most of uh, Palestrina's career was as the choir master of that choir. Uh, so even if he wasn't, at, and he was, at the same time, he was composing music for the Sistine Chapel. And then in the generations to come, and this is part of the legacy, uh, uh, the, his music became a core, core repertory for the Sistine Choir. So, uh, okay, we should talk about the legend. I'm gonna watch my time here. Uh, Elissa has this book, I don't know if she has Bishop's <laughs> Crozier or something that after a certain time I'm not permitted to speak. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> During his lifetime, Palestrina was highly regarded. He may not have been as famous as some composers in Europe, partly because he didn't travel that much. On the other hand, he was, you know, central to, you know, among the most important churches in Christendom. Um, and uh, his publications, um, you know, were not, he, he didn't publish a lot early on. That's another way in which you, you know you built a reputation and so Palestrina's reputation built up closer to the end of his life uh, rather than at, at the beginning. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, one uh, way of, of kind of judging that, uh, that how respected he was is that during his lifetime Colleagues, musical colleagues, uh, on two different occasions, separate groups of people, uh, published, made you know, big um, uh, collections of music in his honor, in which, for example, in one case, they took one of his motets, and then each of, I think, 13 different composers took part of it and reworked it in their own way. So this was a kind of homage to Palestrina, you know, using as the basis one of his own works, and, but then showing how his colleagues, you know, wanted to embrace that music and make it their own. And this was very typical uh, of the attitude towards music in the Renaissance. Uh, we have what we call parody masses, where um, basically uh, you take a, you know, the, the whole fabric of a composition and you rework it with a new text and, you know, turn a motet into a mass movement or vice versa and, uh, and so on. So uh, this was quite typical of the 16th century, uh, except not everybody got a big collection in their honor. Uh, and then in beginning in the early 17th century, we start getting this legend that builds up around him, that he had been the savior of church music. Uh, and uh, it started in the first kind of published uh, statement about this was in 1607. Palestrina is now dead, he died in 1594. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, what's interesting here is that this particular person, Akatsari, some of you don't need to worry about it, um, uh, was very closely affiliated with the Jesuits. It turns out that the Jesuits in the 17th century seem to have had a, played a special role in promulgating this notion of Palestrina as the savior of church music. Although he never really worked for the Jesuits except once. He was, uh, for a short period, um, a choir master at a, one of the German colleges in Rome. And that was a good deal because then his sons got to go there free. Mm -hmm. But uh, then he went back to the Capella Giulia and, uh, for the rest of his life. Um, but there are several instances that give us an idea of how the Jesuit network spread this legend. And uh, for example, in 1628, in Salzburg, 
far from Rome, uh, you have the first theater piece, the first play, Latin play, uh, being given at one of the Jesuit schools. They were famous for this kind of thing. They would put on these dramatic productions in Latin, often with very spectacular scenery and so on, even with music by you know, leading composers uh, and so on. Uh, but so there you have it in 1628 in Salzburg. And then in 1629, there was published by a Jesuit a kind of the story. And, and that's kind of, I don't know if I have it here. I may or may not have it. Um, no. Okay. But, but anyway, basically, uh, that uh, apparently th this Jesuit writes, he's French, it's written in French, published in French that Palestrina told this story to a Jesuit who then told it to the author of the publication. So, you know, uh, there seems to have been a Jesuit connection uh, that is very important. And of course, the Jesuits are really important in the Counter-Reformation. But the big, probably the, some sense of how this le legend developed, and uh, I want to read now a couple of paragraphs from the, mo the very, very famous biography of Palestrina that was published in 1828. Okay, this is now 200 years later. Uh, and uh, was published by uh, the, the, the uh, Giuseppe Baini, who was himself uh, the choir master of the Sistine Chapel, uh, who did an enormous amount of research about uh, Palestrina was his god, and he apotheosized it in this biography. I mean, it's a really emotional, romantic biography. Um, but it had enormous influence because Palestrina in the 19th century, as we will see, had enormous influence. Let me read a little bit of this story, which is full of unverifiable assertions and even errors. And we can't go through all of them, but nonetheless, here's what he writes. Um, summoning Palestrina before him, Cardinal Borromeo told him face to face to compose a mass in the desired manner, enjoining on him all possible effort to prevent the Pope and the Congregation of Cardinals, uh, I'm sorry, an effort to prevent, to prevent that the Pope and the Congregation of Cardinals might be encouraged to ban music from the Apostolic Chapel and the Church. This is always a question of intelligibility of the words. Poor Pierluigi, it says. He was placed in the hardest strait of his career. The fate of the church hung from his pen. The fate of the church. And so did his own career at the height of his fame, which is also not true. Uh, on Saturday, April 28, 1565, so therefore this is two years after the close of the council, uh, by order of Cardinal Vitalozzi, all the singers of the papal chapel were gathered together at his residence. Cardinal Borromeo was already there, together with the other six cardinals of the papal commission that the Pope had appointed to, to decide what to do about music. And they say, oh no, uh, Palestrina was there as well. He handed out the parts to the singers, and they sang three masses, of which the Pope Marcellus Mass was the last. The most eminent audience enjoyed them very much but the greatest and most, most incessant praise was given to the third, which was extraordinarily acclaimed and by virtue of its entirely novel character, astonished even the performers themselves. I told you they didn't rehearse. <laughs> uh, their eminences heaped their congratulations on the composer, recommending to him to go on writing in that style and to communicate it to his pupils. So I'm not gonna go through all the different things, but the fact is, what do we know about the Pope Marcellus Mass uh, in its er terms of its early history? Uh, I know of only two dates where we have something hard. Number one, in 1562, the penultimate year of the council, the Mass was copied into the choir books of San Maria Maggiore, where at the time, Palestrina was choir master. He wasn't even at the Capella Giulia at that point. Uh, and um, so that's where he was head, and they, they, they copied the music there, not even in Rome. Well, no, I'm sorry, it was Rome, but not even in, the, in St. Peter's or the Vatican. And then uh, in 16, 1567, the Mass was published. 
Those are the two firm dates. And all the other stuff is, you know, uh, some of it might be true, by the way, but we just don't know. And uh, so, uh, uh, but that's, this, this legend really took off and uh, influenced uh, Palace Street of Spain. So that down brings us to actually considering how Palestrina's music fared in history. And it's interesting, Palestrina is one of those composers, in fact, who over the, the next centuries had an increasing reputation. That's usually not the case, right? People fade away after a, you know, a bright thing. Obviously, there are exceptions. I don't think Mozart's reputation has fallen, Bach's has it fallen, and so on. But there, you know, these are relatively few. And um, <clears throat> for example, most, how many other contemporaries of Palestrina are you familiar with? So let's talk about a little bit about that. So we talked uh, in the 17th century. I saw how, we've seen how the Jesuits were sort of promoting uh, Palestrina's reputation, at least. But um, the um, uh, and, and and the music itself uh, became a part of the core repertory of the Sistine Chapel. However, they also subjected this music, not only the people in the Sistine Chapel, but elsewhere where, where it was performed, um, they sort of brought it up to date in various ways. They rearranged it, they sometimes added continual parts, they added instrumental parts, whatever. So Palestrina's music was performed according to the taste of the day. Um, and this would, would continue into the 18th century. Um, the, in the 18th century, the style became a kind of cornerstone of the teaching of theory and composition. Now this Palestrina's, and this would be increasingly the case, his, his style was recognized as classical, if you will. You know, it was not just something from that time, there was something that was um, permanent about it, something that was elevated above the norm, and it was a, it set a standard that people felt was worth following long after he lived, and that's certainly not true for everybody. Um, and but one of the things that helped do that was a famous textbook, and some of you I'm sure have heard of it. It was by uh, Johann Fuchs, called Gradus ad Parnassum. I don't know anybody hear of that? Okay, you know, kind of the steps to to Parnassus, and. Uh, uh, this was from 1725. Uh, this is a book that Bach knew well, uh, and even though Fuchs was Catholic from the Catholic South, uh, his book got spread all around. And uh, this book is written in the form of a dialogue. Again, kind of classic way of presenting pedagogical, pedagogical material. It goes all the way back to Plato's dialogues. And it's a dialogue between Palestrina and Fuchs except they have pseudonyms. Uh, Palestrina is Aloysius, and uh, Fuchs is Josephus, Joseph. And um, the, uh, uh, you know, he, he uh, writes in this, you know, that, that Palestrina style with Aloysius you know, is the ne plus ultra of musical style. Um, and so this book has had a long, it still is used, by the way, to some extent. I have a copy of it. Uh, so, you know, it's a, uh, uh, a classic in the history of music theory and composition. Um, one composer who became very interested in Palestrina was Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, not a Catholic composer, obviously, but um, we know that Bach had copies of at least one of Palestrina's masses, um, and he arranged it, he added instruments, you know, and then toyed with it here and there. Uh, in the 1730s, uh, Bach undertook a very, very serious study of this style, and it affected uh, his composition in many areas. There are, uh, in fact, some of you know the famous Bach scholar Christoph Wolf. His dissertation was written on Bach in the Stile Antico, which is to say Bach and the Palestrina style. And uh, in his, his dissertation, he goes to all the pieces uh, that um, Bach composed that could be shown to be linked to the Palestrina style. And this includes not only choral works, it, all, it includes 
uh, you know, uh, fugues from the well of Henry Clavier, and you know, movements of the B minor mass, etc. Um, and so uh, this was for Bach a very uh, serious thing. He took Palestrina very seriously. Uh, over in England, the famous um, historian Charles Burney wrote a lot about Palestrina in his general history of music, and in 1771 actually published the Stabat Mater of Palestrina. One thing I should mention, uh, it, it will be more relevant to what I'm about to say, but is that what the, the Palestrina is wrote in many styles because, uh, for example, he had to change his style to satisfy those cardinals, right? He, he had to write in a style that was more intelligible, that was simpler, cleaner, um, and more homophonic, more chordal like. And uh, so, uh, uh, it's this choral style that people associate with the Palestrina style. And this is the uh, characteristic especially of the music at Holy Week. And the music of, in the Sistine Chapel at Holy Week was one of the big things to do and see when you were in Rome for centuries. And you know, the tourists came just for Holy Week. So they would hear the Palestrina who wrote in that style not in the more complicated style that he, that he certainly did. Remember, you're going to hear one mass tonight. Pa Palestrina, Palestrina wrote at least 104 masses. <laughs> so, you know, there's a widespread of style. And, uh, but people had come to know this simple style of Palestrina above all. Um, anyway, so uh, and this was true of the Stabat Mater, which, along with the Pope Marcellus Mass, uh, those are probably the two most famous pieces of, of Palestrina through the ages. We, and when we go to the 19th century now, it gets really interesting. Here we have to distinguish between North Germany and South Germany. Uh, the North, as you know, is Protestant. That's where the Reformation was, right? And then the, the South is Catholic. You know, think Austria, think uh, uh, Munich, uh, Vienna, and so on. So uh, the, the, there, there were sharp differences between these two geographical areas, and yet they had both intense interest in Palestrina, but for different reasons. Uh, in the north, the uh, interest in Palestrina was first driven not by composers, but the writers and the philosophers and the literary uh, critics, if you will. Uh, people like E.T.A. E.T. Well, sorry, E. T. A. Hoffmann, um, and uh, you know, who's associated with me in Berlin, that area. And uh, um, I think I have a quote here from him. Yeah, for, for him, Palestrina was simple, true, childlike, pious, strong, and powerful, truly Christian in his words, like Pietro da Cortona, the painter, and our own Durer in painting, writes E. T. A. Hoffmann. Uh, notice he doesn't say anything about being Catholic. Mm. It's Christian. And so these North Germans didn't see Palestrina as a Catholic composer. They saw him as a Christian composer. And they had room for him in their way of thinking. Uh, they were also under the sway of this very famous uh, man, uh, Johann Winkelmann, who uh, it was the one that really started the, uh, the whole movement of neoclassicism in the visual arts and sculpture, and painting, and, and architecture. Um, and with his uh, kind of ecstatic description of the sculpture of ancient Greece. And, um, you know, he, and he attributed to that art um, what he called noble simplicity. And uh, what's the word, uh, better phrase? Um, I know it's Schnelle Grosse. Um, Quiet grandeur, okay? And these people latched onto those terms and applied it to Palestrina. So they saw him as this classic, you know, a kind of timeless composer, not a parochial Catholic composer. And so that made him acceptable. And it's really interesting how acceptable he became. For example, in 1830, which was the anniversary, 300th anniversary of the um, 
Now, it was the formula of Concord, which was the first formulation of Lutheran doctrine. When they celebrated that, they celebrated that with motets written in the style of Palestrina. <laughs> and, and even Mendelssohn's Reformation, Reformation Symphony, which was written the same year and with the idea of this anniversary in mind, although it wasn't, public, or wasn't uh, performed for two more years. But the opening of it, the slow introduction, uh, musical scholars generally see that as a, 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 you know, Mendelssohn's way of somehow incorporating the Palestrina style into his orchestral symphonic uh, work. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, you, you have that. Then he uh, wrote um, uh, in, eight, in the 1840s, three songs, over 78. And uh, uh, he, I should point out that around 1830, Mendelssohn went to Rome. He saw the Holy Week services. He heard the Sistine Choir, and he, he never forgot that. And his sister Fanny also went to Italy, I assume with him. And so she writes about this Opus 78, these three psalms, which were written for the Berlin Cathedral Choir, Protestant. She says, uh, uh, Felix uh, said it was, or she, she said it was, quote, for eight voices, a cappella, very beautiful, very Gregorian, and Sistine-like. <laughs> So you can see how the Sistine Chapel really was there as a model, but not in any parochial way. Um, and before moving on, I'd just like to mention that uh, uh, there was a composer named Karl Lurve. Some of you may know his name. He's a, he's a well-known composer, but sort of second tier. Um, wrote a lot of songs, um, but he also wrote an oratorio, which he entitled Palestrina in 1841. So now if we switch from here and go to the South, now we're in the Catholic South. And here there was a, a different situation. For one thing, because it was Catholic and you have Vienna as the seat of the Holy Roman Emperor, who is of course in constant contact um, for good or ill with the Pope in Rome, but there was a great deal of cultural interchange between the two. So the music performed in Rome was getting to Vienna, part of their library, you know? and so this music was constantly being performed. And then from Vienna, it went to other Catholic centers, uh, such as Dresden, uh, where the uh, when the King of um, or Elector of Saxony became King of Poland, had to convert to that, so that Dresden was Catholic. And so there's a lot of music that came from Rome via Vienna to Dresden. And so, so uh, uh, that was one. There was this continuous tradition of seeing this Palestrina style music. Then on the other hand, there was a separate Palestrina movement uh, that uh, was uh, quite different. Um, and this, this was particularly centered in the city of Regensburg. Um, at first, okay, not five minutes, she tells me, okay, I mean, just about make it. Um, the, uh, in the 1820s, they decided um, at to completely change the music at the Cathedral of Regensburg. They got rid of all their old music that they had been doing and started to use the Palestrina style. And um, the, uh, one of the leaders in this was a man named Karl Proska. And at the end of the program notes in your program, uh, you will see John Bradley has written about him. I won't say any more about him. Uh, but uh, he was very much uh, involved in all of this. And uh, uh, they, uh, got to the point where they, they were really strong about this. They said, this is the only way, the only kind of church music you can have. And our way of playing it, of, of performing it, is the only way to do it. So, uh, you know, that's sometimes not everybody agreed with those things, but that's the way it was. Um, and uh, I might add also, uh, the model they used of the Sistine Chapel was a little old because as the 19th century wore on, the situation at the Sistine Chapel itself sharply deteriorated. And in fact, it's, uh, there were uh, points in, in the course of the 19th century where the choir was actually disbanded. So uh, that wasn't necessarily a good example to follow, right? So they would use an earlier era. 
And of course, we're talking about Southern Germany in the 19th century, there is this name Richard Wagner. What does he have to do with Palestrina? Well, uh, first of all, he learned about Palestrina when he was very young. And when he became the court music director in Dresden, uh, one of the things he did was to have a really kind of revolutionary concert where he um, had on this concert. It, it uh, began with a, a Mendelssohn symphony, Scottish symphony, and had the Stabat Mater of Palestrina in his arrangement, Wagner's arrangement, uh, and then a Bach motet, and then the Beethoven fifth. <laughs> now this kind of program was really shocking, and it was not done in the church, it was done in the theater. So uh, that's interesting. And anyway, Wagner thought a lot about it, and he, he felt that if there was to be any good church music, you had to go back to Palestrina. And he also felt, felt very strongly that it should be a cappella. And this was something that came from the north. It was the northerners who first started getting rid of the instruments. And they began to influence people in the south. So we began to get this kind of pure Palestrina idea of unaccompanied uh, music like you're going to hear tonight. Uh, so, um, OK. Um, now, uh, Liszt was also involved with some of this stuff. And Wagner had his transcription of the list, who ultimately helped get it published. Now, there was something else going on. Uh, I talked about Regensburg early in the century. In the, around 1870, there was a very important uh, religious movement, religious music movement launched called the Sicilian Movement. And this movement was uh, you know, uh, very Catholic, and the idea was to restore uh, the, the chant to the, to the uh, services. And if you're going to use polyphony at all, it had to be Palestrina style. It's a very important movement. Obviously, you can't do much more about it. I would also just add, while we're in southern Germany, that um, in the 1850s, not, nobody less than Johannes Brahms conducted the Pope Marcellus Mass. So you see, this music got around was very important. And uh, the, I would just like to end. Yeah, we'll, we have enough time. Give me a few minutes. Well, we're all right. Because um, this is too good not to, to finish off. Um, move us in slightly into the 20th century, where we have an opera by Hans Kitzner called Palestrina. Now, this is a work that many uh, critics have been reading a lot about it uh, regard as a true masterpiece. It was its premiere was conducted by no less than Bruno Walter. And on his deathbed, he talked about it and said he was convinced that this was an eternal masterpiece. So, you know, if you have respect for Bruno Walter, and I do, <laughs> I would have to take this seriously. Not everybody agrees with it, but you know, there it is. But I, uh, it is, of course, like the uh, Baini uh, biography, it is full of <laughs> fantasy uh, and stuff. And it's really not about Palestrina, it's really about Fitzner. Uh, he, he was a very difficult man. He has a very kind of tortured history, um, you know, sort of in and out with the Nazis and all kinds of things. I don't consider that he was a Nazi, but he was a, certainly a, uh, a nationalist. And um, uh, he, he drove the Nazis crazy as he drove everybody else crazy, apparently. And I'm just going to finish by reading a little bit of the libretto, uh, to the summary of the libretto, so you get an idea of, the, of how in 1917 this is right in the middle of the First World War. Um, I'll say here, anyway, uh, we're sort of in the middle of the first act. Uh, 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 Palestrina uh, has lost heart. Fame made others jealous. His marriage led the Pope to dismiss him. You, you know about that? And his wife died knowing this. No, she hadn't, she was still alive. <laughs> Since then, Palestrina had written nothing, not true. Uh, Cardinal Borromeo, is visiting Palestrina to explain that because of growing secularism, the Pope plans to banish polyphony from the mass and other offices, to burn the polyphonic masterpieces, and to revert entirely to the Gregorian chant. Emperor Ferdinand I hopes that a new polyphonic mass can be written, which will appease his fears. Borromeo wants Palestrina to undertake this. But, lacking the spirit, Palestrina refuses, and Borromeo leaves in anger. 
Palestrina ponders his loss of faith and the weakness of love. In his despair, spirits of the great music masters of previous ages appear and surround him. The spirits tell Palestrina he belongs to their elect and must fulfill the task. He protests that in the modern consciousness, art cannot thrive. The spirits reply that this is his earthly mission. He must bring the light to his generation. They vanish. In the darkness of his room, angels begin to appear, singing the mass, and his dead wife's spirit approaches. Not seeing them, they're behind him. Palestrina feels a surge of joy as the walls and ceiling open up to celestial light full of glory and angels who sing the glory of the mass, of course. Uh, in a creative transport, Palestrina's pen is inspired, and as it all fades, he sinks exhausted to sleep, surrounded by sheets of music strewn all around the, with the complete Pope Marcellus mass. And anyway, uh, okay, then I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I wanted to read also from the, from the third act, but which is also wonderfully uh, uh, gushing. But, uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I forgot to tell you. I forgot to tell you. There's also an asteroid and a glacier named after Palestrina. <laughs>